All right. Thank you very much. Uh, so I would actually like to thank Vincent because he did like a great introduction for the topic that I'm going to talk about. Uh, although I think we're going to play like good cop, bad cop, because I want to go a step further and let's say try to understand Gaussian process uh, in terms of the uh, Bayesian approach, so to say. So that's the idea of the talk, and maybe at the, and at the very end, I want to focus on how you can use this uh, in a concrete use case. So I'm going to start with a Bayesian linear regression. Then I will start, we'll go to the definition of a Gaussian process as it is and try to understand and make sense of it. And at the very end, I will, let's say, give a little bit of detail on the kernels and how you can use them to do forecasting. So I guess we already have seen what the normal distribution is. So essentially, whenever you have a random vector, it says uh, it has a normal distribution if the density looks like this. So essentially, you have a mean and a covariant functions, which, uh, let's say, specifies the location and the shape, the support of the, of the multinormal uh, distribution. So here we have uh, two examples. On the left-hand side, we have seen how this nice ellipse show how a normal multinormal distribution looks like. It can happen that each of the components is normal, and this weird support actually is an example of something that is not multivariate. So here you can see that uh, the devil is uh, in the details, so I want to, uh, let's say, point out uh, some of these things. So let us start with the basic linear regression. So what I do have here is uh, around 100 data points, which I generated uh, with random noise. And uh, let's say the model has an uh, intercept 1 and a slope 3. And I just want to know what's the best fit for that. So what I want to do is uh, get the intercept and the, par the, the slope. But actually, I can do more or aim for more just by trying to find the distribution of the parameters in, the, say, the Bayesian point of view. Uh, and how do I do that? Well, I do that through the Bayes theorem, which says that if uh, I have this set uh, of data and I model it uh, as, uh, with random noise, uh, then we can find the uh, parameter distribution uh, as a posterior, which is proportional to the likelihood times the prior. That's the Bayesian game. So for uh, the prior of the parameters, I'm going to select a, a multinormal distribution, which I, in this case has dimension two. So the uh, intercept and the slope. Uh, and before, let's say, seeing the data, I'm going to sample from the prior distribution to see which are the possibilities that I have. So the game is as follows. I have this specific matrix uh, two, one, one, two which I decided to take because that's my prior knowledge, and I just sampled from that. So I took what sample from the multinormal distribution that gives me two values, the slope, uh, the intercept and the slope, and I draw a line. And I do this many times uh, by sampling from this multinormal distribution, and I, what I get is are all of these lines. So these are all the possibilities on, that I can actually get from the specification of this prior. But now, uh, this is just from my prior knowledge. I actually want to see how the data might affect that, and this is going to be encoded uh, in what's called the likelihood function, which is uh, essentially the probability of the data given the input x and b. And it turns out that this is a, a multinormal distribution again. So in Bayesian uh, analysis, uh, getting the posterior distribution is sometimes uh, not easy. And instead of doing the math, you actually sample from it. So you can run a um, Monte Carlo a simulation to try to estimate the posterior distribution of these parameters. So what we see here is that uh, the estimation with the sampling approach of beta zero is around one. This is okay, -ish. and also we have like the, the standard deviation saying, okay, how certain we are of, uh, of getting those values. And we are, have something uh, similar for the, for the slope. Uh, but uh, the, actually the, the multinormal distribution, the Gaussian distribution has such a nice properties, which it's really strange, but a lot of the results can be obtained analytically. So uh, instead of sampling, if you do a little bit of math, just a little bit, then you can show that the posterior distribution of this parameter is again a Gaussian. And I guess maybe what it's important is that the mean is somehow proportional to this product, and 
maybe you can see that this is essentially capturing the OLS uh, solution of, of the linear regression. So essentially it's hitting in the mean, and I, now that I, I have this uh, analytical solution, well actually I could do this by sampling just from uh, this uh, data, I can just play the same game. I sample from the normal distribution, take two values, that's gonna give me an intercept and a slope. And I play the same game and I plot this in green, and we see how all of these lines actually fit the data much, much better. So this is uh, how we usually uh, work uh, the linear regression problem uh, in the Bayesian setting. So uh, if I want to do inference, if I want to do a prediction, then what I need to do is weight uh, the probability of, let's say, this new input point times the probability uh, of the parameters and take the sum, or take the, yeah, the, uh, the sum of that, and again, it turns out that uh, just because of the form of the multinormal distribution, this is again uh, a multinormal distribution. And if I want to do a prediction, I will sample from that, and I was unlucky enough that actually the prediction point went quite well to the mean, but if it's here within the credible interval, it's fine, because let's say that's the uncertainty that I have in my model. And this is something like that says that if you want to do something that is a polynomial regression or are more nonlinear terms in an additive way, you can do that and you can do the same thing. So just you need to replace, a, for example, if you want to take a polynomial, instead of having x, you will map this to x and the second component x squared and the third component uh, x cubed, and you can actually play the same game and you get exactly the same results. And Independently of, of, of the math, you see that at the very end, you get some explicit expressions, which seem quite mysterious, but the only important thing, and this is the main message, is that everything in this problem can be obtained as the product of phi, which is the embedding, or x, sigma, the covariant matrix, and another phi. These are the building blocks. So you can glue this thing together to get the posterior uh, the, uh, the predictive distribution of your linear model. So essentially, if you have that, you have the solution of your problem. So why not define this as, as some like a, as, a, as a thing by itself? So we define the covariance function or kernel in this specific case as a function that takes two points uh, and it just apply the a phi to x, or you can just think it as a, as a vector in the, as x in the linear model, multiply it by the covariance matrix, and then multiply it uh, by phi of the second point. So this is a real number, three, four, whatever, and uh, this is the meaning of the kernel. Uh, and we, it's important because it specifies the solution of your linear model. And this little phi here, it's what is called the kernel trick, where I can just embed this, uh, let's say, polynomials into uh, the x into a polynomial space, but at the very end, you don't care about it itself, you just care about the kernel, right? So yeah, so when I've also first read the, this, the, the definition of a Gaussian process, I was super confused, and the reason I'm giving this talk is to try to see how much I can understand this. I, and I did want to match the definition that I found in Wikipedia with some experiments uh, that I'm going to show you in a second. So I guess the, the moral is that whenever I give you or someone gives you a kernel function, this actually implies a distribution over functions. So at the moment, this makes not a lot of sense, but we're trying to make sense out of it. So if you go to Wikipedia, this is the notion of Gaussian process. So a Gaussian process is a collection of random variables, any of which a finite number of them have a multinormal distribution. So what? Uh, so, and it says that you can have the mean and the covariance is what it specifies uh, the Gaussian pro process properties, which is the usual mean and the covariance in the usual case using the expectation value. But I want to just mention that we already have seen a Gaussian process. And the Gaussian process is just the linear regression with this prior. So uh, let us see why if I take a prior, 
which is a normal with mean zero and sigma as the covariant matrix, and I take this product with a, yeah, this a phi, or even the vector, this is a linear combination of normal distribution, which by definition, since this thing is multinormal, is a, a joint, mod, a, a, it, it defines a, a joint a multinormal a probability. So this is a Gaussian process in this definition, and it has mean zero, and the covariance given by Wikipedia's definition actually coincides with the natural, uh, let's say, brick, uh, which we define via the simple linear regression, right? So this is an example of a Gaussian process, and now I want to show uh, why people often say that the Gaussian process is the infinite dimensional analog of the multinormal distribution uh, in this context of, of function spaces. But instead of doing uh, the math, I'm going to, let's say, just explain you how to sample from a function. So to sample from a function is really hard because it's, these things are infinite dimensional and you don't know how to do that. But you can specify a function by just by saying what's the image of any grid of points. So in order to sample for functions, what I do is first I set a grid of points, uh, which I call x, uh, x star, and then I do the following thing. I define this matrix capital K, uh, which has each kernel combination for each point. So in this example, I have 80 points, x star, and this is a matrix of dimension k times k. So whenever I sample from this, I will get uh, 80 points, and I draw them here, and this would be one of these iterations. So it turns out that when I sample from this, uh, in this way, the functions that I get are linear functions. But that's not clear why, because uh, I'm just sampling from this uh, multinormal distribution with this kernel. So what is important is when, whenever I give you a different kernel or the kernel changes, this actually is going to give you different properties of the sampling function that you will get. Uh, yeah, and of, uh, we haven't seen the data, so if we have, let's say, the same linear regression problem, now the next thing that we want to use Gaussian process for is to uh, try to, to find a fit. But this is... I guess the key slide on which instead of sampling from parameters, so here we don't have like intercept or slope. We're just sampling from this uh, multinormal distribution and it happens in this case that we get a straight line. But given the prior, if I just construct the same, uh, let's say Gaussian process with mean zero and the kernel matrix, well, essentially the same, but just including the training data, uh, I can now let's say how I would find the best fit. Well, I will sample from this one, and then I will take out all of the lines which don't fit my training data. So, like, if they're really far away, take them out. If they're good, then just take them. But we don't need to do that because we're actually in, in what we want to do is to condition on the training set. So instead of uh, just let's say, staying with this uh, pure Gaussian process, we can condition on the training data and the input data. And this thing is, again, a multinormal distribution. And what is important is not the formula, but it just, just depends on the kernel. So the kernel is capturing absolutely everything here. And if I do the same game where I sample, again, I'm not sampling on parameters, but I'm sampling on functions, uh, this is what we get. So if you, let's say, work out these formulas, this is exactly the same, these are the, exactly the same expressions as the Bayesian linear regression. They are exactly the same. The only thing that changed was the point of view on which uh, I forget about the parameters and I start sampling uh, in this Bayesian way in a space of functions. And that for me is when I began understanding what a Gaussian process was actually doing. Uh, but then uh, you have a new universe open up for you because, uh, as we seen in the previous talk, the selection of the kernel uh, gives you different type of curves uh, for your Gaussian process. So the first one is, uh, so there's a zoo of kernel functions, and these are ones which have somehow an interpretation. 
Uh, so the first one is just the one that we have seen for the linear model, uh, which is called the dot product kernel. And uh, actually, you can take powers of it uh, to generate uh, high-order polynomials, as we've seen before. And then we have this square exponential, uh, which is just taking the, the exponential of the differences. And uh, actually, one can prove the following. If you take your linear regression with these uh, polynomial terms, like x, x squared, x cubed, and you take all of the polynomials, the kernel that you will get from this linear regression in the limit is this one. So the a square exponential can be thought as the natural kernel coming from a linear regression with infinite polynomials. And that's why uh, all of these lines drawn from this Gaussian process are really smooth. Because a natural question is like how smooth these lines are going to be. Because as we've seen the interaction uh, between the points depend that all of these kernels uh, depend essentially on the difference. It doesn't need to be like this. But uh, if you want for whatever application control the smoothness, then you want to go for something which is uh, maybe a rational quadratic kernel. And this has another intuition or like a way of, uh, let's say, thinking about it. So it actually, it's a weighted sum of square exponentials, right? And as we have seen, uh, you can also model periodic signals by introducing periodic functions like the sine function. So let us try to see uh, an example on which uh, this uh, can be applied to the nonlinear setting. So uh, it's not important about the, the function that I'm taking. It's a sum of uh, sine functions. But if you are giving this, trying to fit a linear model by yourself, trying to get the features, like is it like cubic or like or, or polynomial order four, well, actually, this is where Gaussian processes can come really handy. So what I'm doing here is just generating random noise out of this nonlinear curve. And I want to see how I could fit the points. So it's a, essentially the same game. I have my prior, and the kernel that I'm going to use is the square exponential. Uh, so there's a little bit of code you can unfortunately not see, but I will share this, and I promise uh, it was, you can actually run these notebooks. And uh, what is important is that I'm uh, running a, a sample from this distribution. Uh, here I have 80 points where I want to test, and then I do the selection, and I plot the images. And you see that in this Gaussian process, we get a lot of these uh, complex and curly curves. And uh, in the, the fact that there's some curvature and complexity is just because this is a different kernel. Uh, and different kernels gives different natures on, on, on the curve space. So these are all your possibilities. So now let's see uh, how, let's say, the joint distribution looks like. And as we have seen, uh, the kernel just depends on the differences. And that's why if I plot a heat map of this a join a of the covariance of the join a distribution, this is how it looks. But actually, we're interested in this little square on which is the new data coming. And the only thing I need to do is to condition. And this is how the new a covariance a matrix would look like. This is not really interesting. What is interesting is this, that whenever I condition a with this a in the joint distribution with this kernel, I get a really, really nice fit. And there's no parameters here. This is a non-parametric way, but it is a nice, uh, let's say, method to, let's say, do a density estimation or model these non-linear uh, signals. And uh, maybe I didn't comment on that, but all of these kernels actually depend on parameters. And these parameters actually are also important in your feed. You cannot just take the, the one that you like the most because this will have an impact on the distribution on functions. So if I take these uh, parameters, let's say, in a different way, I'm going to get different fits. So L for this Gaussian, uh, for this square exponential is somehow the scale. Uh, so if I take it like really big or really low, then this is going to, let's say, define how complex or how flexible my Gaussian process is, even if it's really, really smooth. So there are various ways of selecting these hyperparameters. I don't want to go into details. You can't do it by maximizing the marginal likelihood. 
or via a cross-validation uh, approach. But this is just to point out that this is something that is going to be, uh, could be learned. And uh, the kernel space is uh, quite rich. So uh, the basic kernels that I show, which have some intuition, can actually be combined to just get a huge zoo of kernels, which actually this is where the thinking happened. Because no one is going to give you a kernel coming from heaven. You need to think about the problem and to see how you model your signal. It's not just doing model.fit. This is, in my opinion, where in the Gaussian process uh, methods, the thinking happen, selecting the kernel. For example, how complex do you want it to be? How smooth? Uh, and so on and so forth. And there's a rich theory about uh, how these kernels uh, can be constructed and, let's say, how different spectral properties uh, could give different uh, kernels for different type of applications. Anyway, I just want to, to say that it's a rich, a really rich space and actually sums, products, convolutions, direct sums, direct products, uh, you can uh, get a new kernels from old kernels. So just to finalize, uh, I want to just show how you could do this in practice and there are many uh, ways of doing this. Uh, yesterday we have seen talks uh, with Stan. Also, we can do it yourself. I'm going to show you how to do it with scikit-learn. Unfortunately, the, the resolution is not the best, but I will share this anyway. So what is important is that here I have a periodic signal with noise. And the natural candidate for that uh, is just a exponential uh, sine square function. And you can do this uh, with scikit-learn just by uh, getting the kernels and specifying the parameters. And in scikit-learn, you can define the bounds so that uh, they can optimize for the best parameters uh, by maximizing the marginal likelihood. If you add a linear trend, and here the red line is specifies where I had the like, training and the test set, uh, one way of model that is with an uh, exponential kernel or a radial basis function. And here you take a really long uh, scale so that this, uh, let's say, captures the long-term movement. So just by adding these two, uh, you can model the signal quite well. Uh, yeah, so I can add yet another seasonal component so that, this, so that it mixes with the other one in such a way that the periods are different. And how do I model this new signal? Well, I just add another periodic kernel. And if I want to, depending on how I see the signal and where like domain knowledge and knowing where your data is generated from, this is where you will get insight of how to select the kernel better. And I don't think this is an easy task, but in some of, of, of uh, these applications, it has been proven to be quite successful. And it gives you, even that it's not a parametric model, you understand what's happening if you really think carefully about how to select the kernel. Uh, yeah, so there are some computational challenges. So when people talk about Gaussian process, there's always this question that in order to do inference, you're going to use a, a, essentially all of the data because you need to have this a huge a covariance matrix and then you take some a inverse of certain matrices. So yeah, that's, a, that, that's, uh, that's an important topic in Gaussian processes, but nevertheless, there are ways of doing this in a clever way. So tr try not to invert the matrix, but use some matrix a factorization algorithm or do this by approximation. Uh, so that all, by itself is a, it's a quite a interesting topic. Uh, about some reference, I can just uh, recommend the book of Gelman and others on Bayesian data analysis. They have a chapter devoted on Gaussian process, and they go really fast uh, on the definition of Gaussian process, but they spend most of the chapter studying how kernels uh, should be thought. I have written a, a little bit of experiments about how to show this so that you can play around with it uh, and see how Gaussian process, let's say, work from scratch, so from uh, the basic linear regression towards doing this uh, time series forecasting. And most of the basis of, of my talk actually was trying to understand chapter two of uh, this book on Gaussian process for machine learning of Rasmussen and Williams. So this book, uh, I mean, this chapter has like, I don't know, 10 pages or even less, but it took me a decent amount of time to run these experiments and convince myself that what they claim make it sense, so to say. And this is why I decided to, to, to give this talk. Uh, yeah, and thank you very much. If you have any questions, just let me know. And uh, yeah, thank you.
Okay, any questions? Thank you. Um, you, all, you only showed uh, examples for one-dimensional time series. Are there? Can you use Gaussian processes to also fit two-dimensional or three-dimensional time series? Uh, yeah, actually, uh, when I when you see the definition on Wikipedia uh, of Gaussian process, they don't have a time. They can define Gaussian process in any index set. So in principle, uh, whenever, if you have an assignment of give me a two-dimensional or n-dimensional thing and you can give me a normal distribution, uh, then you can use it uh, in this context. So yeah. So Gaussian processes are defined uh, either for, uh, let's say, more dimensional uh, indices space. Well, thank you for the talk. Uh, I have one question concerning the data that you were fitting. So mostly what I've seen that you were fitting um, um, some some data which can be fit also with um, standard uh, Fourier transform or the um, um, discrete value of Fourier transform. Uh, why? You, I mean, how good they are fitting the data compared to the Gaussian process? Mm, I haven't experimented with that. I did this for myself, so I always take the easiest example first. Uh, what I do know is that you can relate a Gaussian processes with splines. Uh, so you could also try to do okay, what, because essentially I could also fit this with the uh, splines. And for the spline, maybe you need to add the degree of smoothness or how many nodes. Some uh, in this book they claim that Gaussian processes could be a better uh, option there because you don't need to select this. Uh, but I guess it depends on the application, so I don't have a, a concrete answer of why using Gaussian processes against these ones. Okay, yeah. Uh, hi. So you have showed that the kernels have a kind of algebra, so you can add them and stuff. And then in applications, you figure out the best combination. So is there also a kind of basis within these kernels? I mean, that you just can stick with uh, the linear kernels or the polynomial kernels, and then you know that it will converge eventually? Or do you have to... Mm -hmm. is there well, some more I guess, uh, let's say... Once you talk about function spaces, this becomes uh, like an infinite dimensional space, right? So uh, I guess you could try to use some Hilbert space decomposition, uh, but I don't think this is going to help you in practice because, uh, yeah, then you need to specify, okay, how do I project these spaces into my concrete application? What I've seen is that people will go into the data and try, try to see how it was generated, get a domain knowledge, and from that, uh, for example, if you see that the amplitude should be increased with the trend, you will multiply your square uh, sign kernel with a radial basis kernel. And you believe that smoothness is going to be uh, uh, something important for you, then they can uh, control it by adding a, a rational quadratic. So, yeah, I guess it's more on the data knowledge and domain expertise rather than a general framework. Okay, last question. Thank you. Uh, just a short one here. So I just discussed with the uh, other author, uh, Vincent, on the applicability of GPs outside academia. Um, what is your opinion on GPs and their use in, in industry? Yeah, so actually I've used them. I think they've come really handy for modeling, at least in, in uh, the applications that I've done, seasonality, like strange seasonality. Again, you can use as clients. And yeah, I guess you, in, in, in some sense, also get a like the credible interval for splines. What I like about, uh, for example, using our processes is that you can encode a lot of information in the kernel uh, with a lot of uh, intuition and you get the credible intervals uh, for it. So if I need to remove a, a strange seasonality which doesn't look like a sign function, I will just throw a random process and model it like this. Uh, but I do know a lot of people using a uh, Gaussian process in, in, in practice and uh, I guess the, for them, uh, the challenge is about the computations, uh, but I do know they're still quite active.
uh, in industry. Okay, thank you very much, Juan. Very interesting talk, and yeah, another round of applause.